Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mary, and I am an alcoholic. My dry date is the 10th of August, 1984. My group is the Markham Village Group in Markham, Ontario. I have a sponsor, and I sponsor women, and, um, and I am a very grateful, active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I am so delighted to be here, and I don't want to forget anybody. I want to thank Cynthia, the speaker chair, for all your hard work and for inviting me here. And Dave, the chair of the conference, what a wonderful job you've done. Thank you so much. And the committee, uh, a lot of work goes into this and a lot of people and the beautiful flowers in the basket. And the speakers, Vanoi. Vanoi is my friend, my darling friend, and I was so glad she was here to You just inspire me all the time. And I love you very much. And I know even although you were Alan on, I would have been in those honky-tonks right beside you. (laughs) And I'd like to thank Marty. Spoken with Marty, it was a great talk. And thank Brian, great talk this morning. Thank you so much, Brian. And... um, and my sponsees, are, I have a couple of sponsees here, and I have uh, my dear friends. There's two Scotsmen are here that are dear friends of mine, ben, Benny and John. <laughs> and, uh, and when I got sober in Edmonton, Alberta, um, I had a slip. And I went to a lady, and this is 1984, so things were a bit different. And her name was Pat. And I just admired her so much, and I always wanted to please her. And the morning I was going back to take my chip after I had a slip, I said to Pat, Pat, I'm so sorry I let you down, and I let AA down. She said, you didn't let me down, and don't talk to me for a year. (laughs) Where are you, Pat? And I got sober on that. So I will tell you a little bit about what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. I was born in Glasgow, Scotland. I have Scottish, Irish, and English blood. It's sort of like having Braveheart, St. Patrick, and the Queen all rolled into one. I came from a very good Roman Catholic family. My father had been a Franciscan monk who had left the monastery, not for any bad reason. He just had a doctrinal dispute. My mother was president of the Union of Catholic Mothers. (laughs) They were all very good people, and I had no capacity whatsoever to be good. (laughs) I was born with a criminal mindset. Not my fault. (laughs) Not my fault. I didn't want to be like all the people around me. I could imagine myself like Braveheart, naked, blue paint, running through the field shouting, freedom! You know, that's what I wanted. (laughs) There's a visual. (laughs) If there is a predisposition to the illness of alcoholism, I certainly had it. I was born with it. And please keep an open mind. I am one of those it talks about in the big book when it said there are those two who suffer from grave mental and emotional problems, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. My strange personality disorder, abnormal personality, whatever you want to call it, that I was born with and grew with, 
was very much like Bill Wilson's. If you've read uh, his wonderful essay called This Matter of Fear, Bill talks about having this pathological feeling of being different. It totally and utterly isolated him. He felt different. He, had, he, just, he just felt completely and utterly apart from. And he was so filled with fear, he found he was unable to mix with people. And eventually that fear turned to aggression, and he became very aggressive. And that's exactly what happened to me. I had an obsession. I had an obsession with death from a very early age. I had an, an, an inability to get rid of this feeling of entrapment where I was claustrophobically encased in self. I felt everywhere I went, people were looking at me and finding me wanting. Everywhere I went, you were finding me less than and judging me. Also, I had panic attacks, just like Bill Lewis at a very early age. So what I'm trying to tell you is that I always knew there was something seriously wrong with me because people were always saying to me, there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> Every year, my family would take me to Ireland, and we'd go there for the summer. And um, my family in Ireland would look at my mother and they'd say to her, she's not right, you know. And if you're not right in Ireland, you're not right anywhere. Right? <laughs> Just a fact. Um, I figured the, the, what I did know about uh, the way they judged me eventually in England was uh, that I was a bit queer in the attic. Um, <laughs> So, this inability to mix, this horrible feeling of being different, this feeling of aggression, I wasn't able to make friends very well. I had something that most alcoholics are born with, although Al-Anon will never give us any credit for it, and that is I had a high IQ. But the only thing IQ has done for me is I've never completed anything I ever started. <laughs> I get bored very quickly. Anyway, because of this IQ, I did quite well in school, even although I don't know why I did, but I did. And I was sent to uh, Our Lady in St. Francis Senior Secondary for Young Ladies. Uh, there was Franciscan nuns there. And I was 12 when I went. They're almost 12. I didn't like the nuns, and the nuns didn't like me because I had an inability to take instruction. I did not like structure, and uh, I had a behavioral disorder because I couldn't sit still for long. And uh, I, when at 15, at age 15, a nurse, uh, a nun rather, hit me over the, the hand with a ruler. And I figured if she could give it, she could take it. God, you're a sick bunch. It's only, it's only in AA you laugh at that. You go out there and tell them, and they don't laugh. But here's the beautiful thing. I truly believe that this spiritual illness that I had, that Carl Jung said we had, that we had, the alcoholic seems to have a thirst for a union with God. He has a thirst, but it's a wrong thirst. And I believe that God was always behind me. There's a wonderful old poem that our, um, our co-founders loved. It's called The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. And it's about this man, and he thinks that this, this, this dog is chasing him. And eventually he turns around and confronts it, and it's God. God has been chasing him through the alleys and through the gutter. And believe you me, I know what it is to live in the alleys in the gutter. 
And um, the mother superior, they expelled me. And uh, I think that was a bit of an overreaction, but they did. And, uh, <laughs> and the, the mother superior said to me, uh, we've sent for your long-suffering mother. <laughs> and you sit outside my door and wait for her. But while you're sitting there, I want you to memorize that sign above my desk, above my door. And I looked at it and it said, of courtesy it is much less than courage of heart or holiness, but in my walks to me it seems that the grace of God is in courtesy. And way back then I wanted nothing to do with the grace of God, and I wanted nothing to do with courtesy. But many years later, having lost everything of value in my life, having no humanity left, having no femininity left, coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, it was your courtesy you extended to me that had me stay here. And it was the grace of God that brought me here. Because so it came true for me. I went off in my merry way and I broke my mother's heart. I did not know how to live without stealing, lying, cheating. It just came natural. Nobody ever taught me how to do it. It just came natural. And uh, I got a job, and I figured they weren't paying me too much, so I decided to fix the books to pay myself a little bit extra. <laughs> of course, they brought in an auditor. They always ruin things. And, uh, <laughs> and then they sent for my mother. And, uh, <laughs> my father, when he came out of the monastery, had gone and joined the army. And um, he was, my father was a very brave man. He loved God. He was in Dunkirk. My mother's two brothers were killed, one buried in Greece, one buried in Belgium, of other um, family members who were in concentration, Japanese concentration. I came from a family who loved their country, who loved God, and who had great values. I had none of those, absolutely none. Now, definitely I was ill. I was not right. You know, every year I went back to Scotland for years. I have these two old, old aunties, the ones that came and took me off the street in Miami. And no matter how long I've been sober, every year I go in the door and the first thing they say to me is, has that AA found out what's wrong with you yet? <laughs> So, I got into a lot of trouble for a few years, broke my mother's heart. <laughs> because I was so different and felt, I didn't, people didn't like to be around me because I had a habit of, if I didn't like how you looked, I'd just give you a quick punch and uh, <laughs> that's not how to win friends and influence people. And, uh, and also, I was very nervous if you got too near me, so people stayed away, and uh, I had panic attacks. And, um, but, you know, my friends, start, my peers started dating, and I figured if I do what they do, maybe I'll be like them, because they seem to have an ease and comfort in the world that I never had, and I wanted to be like them. So I went out on my first date, and I don't know if the American men are like Scottish men, but <laughs> with Scottish men... At the end of a date, they want a reward. <laughs> so, so I am there with this fellow, and he's getting very passionate, and I'm just kind of watching him, I'm detached. because I'm thinking about myself. And, <laughs> and at the height of his passion, I said to him, so what do you think about death? <laughs> he said, I think you should go home now.
You see, I did not know that my solution to all of that was in a glass of alcohol. I did not know that. I never wanted to drink because I come from a Gaelic culture. And uh, I just, I just did never, ever wanted to drink alcohol. But that was my solution. Um, eventually, I decided to clean up my act. I went down to London, England. And at 21 years of age, I was with BOAC, which is now British Airways. And I was an overseas escort. And I was flying all over the world. I'm up in a plane with all these people. I don't like people. <laughs> I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> and I have panic attacks. <laughs> but I could pass an interview, and I don't understand all that. But, um, so it was not a good career choice, and uh, so I, I decided to get married. You see, I was always looking for a solution. I was always looking for someone to understand me. I'm so happy I can laugh at it now. But I utterly and completely isolated it, and, and it was a horrendous feeling. And I have such compassion for Bill because I understood he spoke to my soul when I read him. And, and, and the feeling of alienation in the world was I tried everything. I tried everything to fit in. And... Um, and I thought, if I get married, maybe I'll be better. So um, I met a really nice man. He was a very cultured man. You know, I might have been crazy, but I wasn't stupid. I, uh, I married a wealthy man, and uh, he took me to live in Kingston, Jamaica. And in Kingston, Jamaica, I had everything that money could buy. And after a year, my first son was born. And when that boy was born, I held him in my arms and I thought, my God, how could I create something this perfect? I love that child from the deep down from my toes through my soul. I have never loved and felt the way I felt when I held that child. And just after he was born, one day I thought I was going insane. I was 25 years of age. I had been walking the world trying to have a normal life and it never ever came. And at this moment, which was my pivotal moment of happiness, I think I'm going to lose it and I'm going to go completely mad. And I'm going to lose control and never get back. And they brought a doctor, and the doctor wanted to give me an injection, and a friend of mine said, give her a drink. I'd never had a drink. Jamaica has 151 proof rum. <laughs> it is beautiful. <laughs> I drank that 151 proof rum and it went all the way deep down inside of me like a piece of velvet. And it wrapped itself around every raw nerve ending I had been walking around for 25 years. Dr. Silk was said men and women drink because they like the sense of ease and comfort that they get. That's what I got. If I hadn't got that, I wouldn't have drank it. I didn't drink to get high. I was born on high alert. I drank to get a little bit of shush, <laughs> right? Just a little normal living. That's all I wanted. And for some reason that they don't even understand today in 2018, for an alcoholic of my type with the predisposition of the personality disorder and this other thing that I have deep inside of me, the alcohol can come in and do for me what no psychiatrist can do and no pill can do. That's some kind of wonderful. And I had found my magical elixir and I drank every day. And for a long time, it was good. Not a long time, because men and women go, down, women go down the road quicker than men, but for about four years. And then my second son was born. I drank every day I carried that child because by then I had lost the power of choice and drink. And I'm not, I only say that to you because that's who I was. I'm ashamed of it today, but I didn't know how to do any different. I thought if I don't drink, I'll, I'll go mad. I was absolutely sure of that. And I don't know why my boy didn't suffer from the effects of al me drinking alcohol every day, but he didn't. And I don't understand that. Um, and uh, then I just went crazy for a while. 
because I had crossed the invisible line. The cucumber had become a pickle. I don't normally tell the Bob Marley story anymore because I told it for so many years, but Dave wants me to tell it. <laughs> so I used to live across the road from Bob Marley on Hope Road in Kingston. His, uh, his record producer had given him a big old great house on Hope Road. That's where his museum is today. And I lived right across the road. And I didn't like Bob. I didn't like Bob because I thought Bob was a pothead. <laughs> and he brought down the neighborhood with that. <laughs> and Bob didn't like me because I'm a drunk. And alcohol is against the Rastafarian religion. My friends used to say to me, Mary, come try a little sense of me, oh, your man. Look how the liquor's making your eyes red. And I used to say, I don't want nothing that's going to screw up my brain. I'll stick to liquor. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, Bob had a BMW and I had a BMW. And one day I'm in the garage and I'm waiting for them to fill up my car and I'm standing with my Dunhill cigarette lighter kind of swaying in the breeze, half drunk, thinking about myself. <laughs> and, and Bob drives up, Bob drives up in his BMW. And uh, he shouts at me, he shouts out my name, my full name. And uh, he said, you think you're smart, you drink your, you drink your, I won't use the word, you drink your liquor and you think you're smart. He said, you're a hedonist and a narcissist and you don't care about anybody but yourself. He said, if you think you're so smart, what does BMW stand for? I said, Bavarian Motor Works. <laughs> he says, no, man. It means Bob Marley and the Whalers. <laughs> so much for him. <laughs> I... It, my, I've been married, I, I, I got married, when I was young, I got married with alarm and regularity. Um, <laughs> so my husband, uh, he had, all of my husband have had nervous conditions um, that they didn't have. <laughs> Not my fault, you know. So um, my husband, uh, he was uh, such a nice man, and I got into a lot of trouble. I got into trouble with the police for uh, beating up a dry cleaner. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he used to take me to the country club, and uh, people used to love me, but by now I, I don't behave. I, I don't know how I'll behave. I might have one drink, and I'll be okay. And I might have a couple of drinks, and I would just be absolutely and utterly obnoxious. And I will... If someone disagrees with me, I'll break a bottle and challenge them to a duel. And, uh, and he would run me home and he'd lecture me and I'd say, if you drop asleep tonight, I'll kill you. And, he'd be... <laughs> and one night he did drop asleep and I hit him over the head with a piece of mahogany. That is a hard wood. <laughs> he had no sense of humor about that whatsoever. <laughs> And his mother came to see me. And uh, they called my mother in Scotland because nobody knew how much I drank and nobody knew what was wrong with me. And they said to my mother, there's something seriously wrong with your daughter. My mother said, there was always something wrong. <laughs> so because I am obnoxious, because I'm selfish, self-willed, run right, 
and because I don't care about anybody but myself, and because now alcohol is a... I love my children with every fibre in my being. Make no mistake about that. I love them, but I am a hopeless alcoholic, and I cannot stop drinking. And I don't want anybody telling me or monitoring me and telling me what to do. So I decide I'm going to divorce my husband and take my children and leave the island. And uh, he didn't want me to take the children. And I said, if you don't... I threatened him with something that, I, that was utterly dreadful of me. So I left the island and uh, took my children, went to Scotland. My boys were five and nine then. My children went on a journey with alcoholism and they never touched a drop. My children lost their innocence, not because I ever physically abused them. I never physically raised my hand to my children. But I am a hopeless alcoholic mother. And when I take a drink, the drink takes me. And I don't know what I'm going to do and who I'm going to bring home. Oh, there's no sense of security with a, an alcoholic mother. And in Scotland, they told me about my drinking. And a man called that I'd known for a while. And he said, let's get married and I'll take you to Canada. I thought, what a good idea. <laughs> I love getting married. I just don't have any follow through. <laughs> because here's what happens to me. I fall in love, or whatever it is, and him and me are like Velcro. And then we get married. And then after about three weeks, <laughs> I can hear him breathing three doors down. <laughs> Did he always breathe like that? <laughs> and then it's thrill is gone and I'm off looking for that ding a ling a ling someplace else. <laughs> and uh, and uh, actually, so I used this poor man to get to Canada. By this time, I'm shaking so much I can't hold my drink up. I, because I'm bright, I realize I have a Valium deficiency. Um, I get a job as a pharmaceutical rep. I could always get a job. Don't ask me how I always get a My territory was southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, and B.C. My head office was in Beaubriand, Quebec. And... Um, I was supposed to go around all these doctors all over um, detailing these medications because I forgot to tell you I had done some nursing in Scotland. And um, I was a blackout drinker on the road. And I sent that nice man I'd married, I sent him away. And uh, it was just me and my two little boys. You know, I was sitting, saying to Benoit before the meeting started, listen to the music. The great music of Alcoholics Anonymous, the laughter and the joy of people who have come off a sunk ship. It's an amazing thing to me. And a lot of times I don't know why I deserve what I have today. And I am so grateful when I think of the life that I led and the life that my poor children led. Because what I would do as an alcoholic mother, because this is a horrendous disease, make no mistake, Sometimes I would tell my little boys I was going out to get something and I'd go to the bar just for one drink, just one. And of course I have a phenomenon of craving that I don't understand. And I have one and I have to have two and three and four. And then I will wake up lying on the bathroom floor in this old place I don't even know. And then a man says, can I take you home? And I'll take that man home. And my children will be in bed and they'll wake up through the night and they'll see this strange person there. And the next day, I won't remember. And they'll say to me, Mommy, who was that man that was here last night? And I'll say, there was no man. You were dreaming. And I made my children question their reality. And I'd drive with them drunk in the car. And sometimes they'd ask me to cook a little something and bring it to school. And I'd say, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. I'm going to cook for my little boys. And then I couldn't. And then I'd say, just one, just one. And then I'd have to have another one, another one. And then I'd cook. And I'd take it down to their, their little schools, and I'd be so drunk, I'd fall down. 
almost before I got, and they'd see me there, and the little eyes would be looking at me, the eyes of the child or the alcoholic, the broken promises and broken dreams. And um, I, had a, I had a terrible case of al- alcoholic telephonitis. I don't know if anybody in here has ever suffered from that. <laughs> alcoholic telephonitis is a phenomenon that never attacks in the day. <laughs> it usually approaches around midnight. When you're sitting alone with your jug and you want to call somebody and tell them how you've been screwed by the world. (laughs) But you don't call anybody nearby because they might come. (laughs) And I'd call Scotland and as they said hello, I'd pass out. So my two old aunts came and this is called Irish rationalization. They told me I had early menopause and put me in detox. <laughs> in detox, it was just me and five Native Canadians. I had DTs and uh, convulsions. And they would hold my soup and my coffee because I was shaking so much I couldn't hold it by myself. And they told me that they drank because their spirit was broken. And I realized at some level my spirit was broken. I got out of there and my family thought because I was cleared of alcohol that I was okay. And they went back to Scotland and I decided I'd go to Jamaica because my children needed to be near their daddy. He hadn't sent me any child support for two years. And I just thought, you know, The idea that someday, somehow, we will enjoy and control our drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Some of us pursue it into the gates of insanity and death. And I did that. I did that. I lived that. And you know, we always think this time is going to be different. Changing people, places, and things. Not knowing that the only thing we have to change is ourself. And unbeknownst to me, my eldest son, who was now 11, had written to his daddy and said, Daddy, when I come back to Jamaica, I never want to live with mommy. I love her, but she's a terrible drunk daddy. She drives with me and my brother drunk in the car. She brings men home, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid. I went back to Jamaica with my boys, and I thought the father was taking them for a week. And at the end of the week, I called, and he said, You're not getting them back. You're a drunk. You're a lush. And if you try and take them, I'll... Put, you on, put my son on the stand to tell the judge about you. And uh, I could not believe, I was such a horrible drunk, and yet I could not believe that I'd never have my children again. And I didn't want to put my boy in the stand, and it was a nightmare. And I went back to this old house I had rented in Kingston, and I took two bottles of Allium and two bottles of 151 proof rum. I wanted to die. But alcoholics are hard to dead. (laughs) We don't die easy. (laughs) When people say to me, if I drink again, I'll be dead, I say, you wish. (laughs) (laughs) Some of us live forever drinking. And somebody found me and they pumped out my stomach and I was taken up to Kingston Hospital, University Hospital in Kingston. And that was December 1979. And they pumped out my stomach. And the next day a psychiatrist came and told me something that was very observant, intellectually correct and definitely relevant to my condition. The psychiatrist said to me, you mustn't do that anymore. I wasn't allowed to see my children. I was living in an old rundown hotel in Kingston with a lot of other drunks, all expats who, like me, had once upon a time had dreams, and the sun had been our undoing. And uh, you know what it's like. You, alcoholism is the loneliest illness in the world, and you want somebody to drink with and you have a few drinks, and I would find a man who drank like me. 
and we'd have a few drinks and all of a sudden he looked real good. <laughs> and he told me I looked beautiful. <laughs> and him and I would wander off into the enchanted cottage. <laughs> the only thing is the sun comes up. The pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization of doing that one more time. And one morning, as if prearranged, me and my escort of the night before walk out of the hotel and a car passes by with my ex-husband, his new wife and child, and my two sons. And he came and said to me, if you don't leave the island, I'll kill you. And he threw the two years support money he owed me, the child support. And I left the island, I went to Miami to drink myself to death. I did not want to live without my sons. And I was filled with despair, ultimate terrible despair. I could not stop drinking. My life, everything of value was gone. And uh, I got a little apartment so I could drink myself to death. And I'd leave the door open because I'm a drunk. And they'd come in and steal my furniture and steal my clothes and steal my money and steal me. I didn't know anybody in, in Miami. It was just me. And eventually I got thrown out of the apartment because um, I couldn't pay my rent anymore. And I ended up living at the bottom of Lincoln Road on Miami Beach. And my life down there was like going through a sewer in a glass bottom boat. And uh, there's no need uh, for me to go into what goes there, but you're just taken up and used like, and thrown away like an old piece of cloth. And there is no humanity left and no femininity left. And uh, that is alcoholism, the most horrible illness in the world. And we are the lucky ones. Are we not the most fortunate people in the world? <laughs> and uh, one day I, was pan I panhandled off an old woman called Joyce McNeil, and she used to live in Jamaica, an old English woman, and now she lived in Fort Lauderdale. And I believe she was another one of those things that was just put in my life. And she knew my family, and... My father, this is, this is my legacy. Without the steps, I could not live sober because I couldn't bear to think about all the things I'd done to hurt all the people I used to love. My father had retired and uh, did, nobody knew where I was. Nobody knew I'd lost the children. I said to my mother at three o'clock one morning, I don't know where my lassie is. I don't know where my grandchildren are. I'm going for a walk. And he dropped dead in the street of a massive heart attack at the same time I was living on the street. And um, my family, I, w I went back to Canada. And uh, in Canada, I spent four years in and out of psychiatric care. They diagnosed me as a manic depressive. I was on lithium. I was on oh, lithium, librium, valium, all the lovely yum yums, yum yum yums. <laughs> And I love being in there because I'm safe. And uh, they used to bring AA meetings in to the institution and they used to make me go and I'd never, I, I never heard anything. I was so full of different medications. And the AA members who brought those meetings in told me later that they used to ask me if I had hope. And I said I had no hope. And when I, the last time I was in there, I was in a lot of trouble and I was having to face a big court case when I got out. My doctor, my psychiatrist was trying to help me. He said, I've written something to try and keep you out of prison. And he let me read it. He said, uh, he diagnosed me for a few different things, but in his opinion, in the end, he thought I had three psychiatric illnesses. One, chronic alcoholic. Two, abnormal personality. Three, depressive. And also a great desire to be loved by other people. <laughs> Even although she doesn't seem to have capacity. 
to love. And I went to court and the judge called me a tragic social circumstance. And I was a tragic social circumstance till I came to you. One night I was drinking myself sober and I picked up the phone and I phoned AA. And a matey, uh, you know what a matey is? Yeah. If, for you don't know, it means uh, he Native American, French, and he 12 stepped me. And Stan had 28 years sobriety. And um, I love this, I always tell this because it's so funny. He said, Mary, tell me a little bit about you. And I told him, and he said to me, I think you're one of us. And nobody had ever said that to me. And I said, Stan, I know I'm an alcoholic, but I'm also nuts. I've got a psychiatric report that says I'm nuts. He said, Mary, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is like 12 adjustable wrenches. They fit any nut that comes through the door. <laughs> And uh, I told you I had one slip. My dry date is the 10th of August, 1984. On the 9th of August, 1984, a little girl from Winnip a little girl spent the night with me. And the next day she said to me, I'm going to leave you now because my sponsor said you're a loser. <laughs> and I only stick with winners and Alcoholics Anonymous. But before I go, I'm going to ask you to kneel down and say the third step prayer. And I said to her, I kneel for nothing. And then something said, think of your children's eyes. And I knelt down and as if God gave me a vision, I don't know, but it was like a real playing in my head, like a movie playing through my head. The previous uh, uh, winter, I had just got out the, uh, one more time out the Misericordia Psychiatric Unit. And I had uh, a lot of medication and I called my family to arrange that I could go to Jamaica to see my sons. And uh, the father said I could come to Jamaica if I stayed in a certain hotel. He'd check on me throughout the day to make sure I wasn't drinking. He'd have someone bring my boys to the airport and I could have them for five days. And he put my sons on the phone. And my son said, Mommy, Mommy, we miss you. We hear you had another nervous breakdown. We just miss you so much, Mommy. And I said, what do you want for Christmas? And they told me. And I got, on a, I got on the plane in Edmonton, Alberta, and I had to change in Toronto. And in Toronto, I bought a bottle of vodka. And between Toronto and Kingston, Jamaica, I drank the vodka. And when I got off at the airport, my boys were shouting, Mommy, Mommy, and I dropped down drunk at their feet. And the people who brought my sons to the airport said, you won't be seeing your mother this trip. And I was lying on the ground and he was leading my boys away and they're looking over their shoulder with the eyes of the child of the alcoholic, the broken promises and broken dreams one more time. And that's what I thought about. And something happened to me and I don't know what it was. But from that moment to this, I haven't had one desire for a drink, not one. I had reached a place. I had reached a place of despair and hopelessness that William James talks about. The breaking place. The place that breaks you open through despair. And it cracks you open enough for a little aperture for God's grace to come in. And I believe that's what happened. I got very active in AA. And uh, I had wonderful people in Edmonton. I, I, I'm just so grateful. I got a sponsor called Carol. Right, Pat, she just died not long ago. <laughs> Carol, I was doing a big book study up in, up in the hills of Calgary, and they brought Carol to see me. Uh, this is a few years ago. And I said to Carol, Carol, a lot of people, in, a lot of people I sponsor are being 13-stepped. I was never 13-stepped. <laughs> she says, do you remember what you looked like when you came in? <laughs> And uh, I remember, you, could, you know, the kind of AA I got was amazing. I did a fourth and fifth when I was about six weeks sober because I couldn't stand myself. And uh, I did it with a Jesuit. 
And um, I, I got very active in AA, and, and they told me to find a God in my own understanding. And I knew something wonderful had happened to me, but I just could not, I didn't have no idea of this God. I just couldn't get my head around it. Whatever it was had happened to me, I just didn't understand it. I just accepted it. I thought it was some AA magic. And then the old time was saying, you've got to find a God in your own understanding. And, you know, the messenger comes in various shapes and sizes. I don't know if you remember, was it old Helen? I think it was old Helen. And one day I heard this woman, and she was the most spiritual woman I'd ever heard. And she was singing about her God. And she was saying things like, as a drunken woman, I never went to bed with an ugly man, but I sure woke up with a few. <laughs> she said, but I don't do it anymore because I am a lady in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went up to her afterwards, and I said, who is this God you have? I'm looking for a God. She said, Mary, my God's called Harold. I said, Harold? She said, yep. You know that prayer, our Father who art in heaven, Harold be thy name. (laughs) She was pulling my leg. And then I, uh, I found out just before I was a year sober that uh, my son was going to, my eldest son was going to Toronto. My sponsor, Carol, we formed an um, formed, uh, intergroup in Toronto, and uh, two people met my flight, and they took me to the YWCA, and I checked in there, and I got a job, and I got an apartment, and, uh, and I got a sponsor called Rini, who died for 53 years sobriety. And I got very active in the rooms of AA, and my son went back after a year, went back to Jamaica, and I would fly up and down and make amends and uh, go to Scotland and make amends. Unfortunately, mom and dad were dead, but um, I, I won't get into it, but I, was, I was, had good guidance and good sponsorship to be able to make amends to my dead parents. And then I told you about John last night in the workshop, looking after John, and, um, and, and, and life was good. And then, um, I, you know, I got married in AA. It did not work out, but I was able to look after him eventually. And then, um, I heard that both my sons had been put out of their father's house. They didn't get on with stepmother. And I spoke to my sponsor. I was eight years sober. My sponsor told me I had to go back to Jamaica and make amends to the island. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and back to Jamaica, and I live with my old ex-mother-in-law because she always loved me. And if you really want to know how you're doing, go and live with your old ex-mother-in-law. <laughs> She'll tell you. And uh, my boys wanted to leave the island. Um, one of them wanted to go to Scotland to my family for some education, and the other one wanted to go to um, Florida school, uh, Broward Community College, and I did that. I worked with the poor people down there for a while, and I tried to get involved in AA. It wasn't very strong down there. I had, I had long-distance sponsorship, and uh, I came back. And then my two boys came to live with me. After 13 years, I got my sons back. What is this but a miracle? (laughs) We lived together for two years, and then I sent them off to be self-supporting through their own contributions. (laughs) My eldest son got married on Vancouver Island. And he called me, he said, Mommy, will you come and walk me down the aisle with my daddy? His father flew out from Jamaica, and him and I walked my son down the aisle. And then my uh, youngest boy got married in a Ukrainian church in full Scottish dress and danced with me to a tune called Mama. And my boys are so loving to me. And um, they've given me five little grandchildren. And my grandchildren have never smelled alcohol in my breath. And my sons call me all the time. I just got, I was just sharing a couple of texts I got before I got up to speak. And, you know, they just tell me how much they love me. And uh, my sons sometimes say, Mom, if ever I feel down, I just think about where you've been and you give me inspiration. A couple of years ago, I took my two eldest granddaughters to Scotland and we walked on the earth that my granny walked, and my great-granny and my great-great-granny, we walked on the same soil, and I walked it sober. 
And uh, I, this program has given me things that I do not deserve. All I've ever done is follow. I believe in strong sponsorship. I need my sponsor more today than I've ever needed them because I don't want to mess up. I don't want to have one more mistake. And if I get into an emotional state, then I, sometimes I don't know the right thing to do. So I take everything to my sponsor when I need a decision. And you know, life is good. Life is life. You know, I've gone through a lot of things in, in the 33 years I've been here, but never once has the thought of a drink crossed my mind. And you know, it says we have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. That means that every morning I have to, when I wake up, I got to get in fit spiritual condition before I go out there. You know, beyond this place, there be dragons called people, places, and things, <laughs> right? And most days it's wonderful. But, there, you know, there's a line from Moby Dick that I love. And it's, uh, the line goes like this. When I feel myself growing grim about the mouth and the cold, chilly November winds are blowing through my soul and I want to step out onto the street and knock people's hats off, I know it's time to go to sea. When I feel like that in the morning, I know it's time to call my sponsor. <laughs> There's just every now and then you get a great day. And when I get a great day, I'll go out there and I'll start counting things in the 10 product line and bring it to their attention that they've got four too much in the basket. <laughs> or else, you know, the drop hangers, I'll tell them, I really think they should do better, and they don't always take it well. <laughs> and that's because I have something going on inside of me that I am finding fault out there. And I'll just finish with this little thing to tell you, that no matter how spiritual we get, we never rise above human being. And this is a continual journey that we are on. And this journey that we, for me, this journey that I am on is about defects of character and about a, a personality disorder that because of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm not saying, criticizing anybody, I haven't had medication since the 10th of August, 1984. I haven't been in, locked up since the 10th of August, 1984. I haven't been in trouble since the 10th of August, 1984. <laughs> I'm very, very happy about that. But Five years ago, I was working for a woman that God had put in my life to test my serenity level. <laughs> I, I, I had been with her for four years because once my husband died, you know, a lot of the money had gone into taking care of him as well, and uh, I, I just needed the money. And she used to throw files at me. And I used to say to her, you shouldn't do that, you'll upset yourself. I could see myself picking up the file and wrapping it around her face and just giving it a, a gentle twist till I heard <laughs> <laughs> You can think what you like, but you gotta act right. <laughs> right, right girl? So anyway, one day I walk in there and I don't know, maybe I was in fit spiritual condition. This is five years ago. I walk in and she throws a file at me as I walk in the door. And it's just her and me in the office. And I went to the front door. I said, God, I'll see you when I come out. <laughs> and I took her inventory from when she was born. And I had that most incredible rage. You know that rage that makes you omnipotent? <laughs> and it didn't last, it must have only been just a couple of minutes, but anyway, in the end, she's sitting cowering in her chair, and I stop as soon, quick as I started, I stop. And she said, I think you should go home, you're not feeling well. And uh, <laughs> I said, till you go home. I've got words. <laughs> she ran out the door. <laughs> I got down on my knees and wept with shame. 
and ask God to please forgive me for treating one of his kids like that. To lose my temper like that is unforgivable at my stage of sobriety. And I called my sponsor. My sponsor said, I told you. (laughs) Didn't I tell you? Are you listening this time? You're always staying in relationships past the expiry date. (laughs) She said, I want you to go in in the morning and make amends and give her a week's notice. And I did that. And afterwards, I did some intensive four-step work on that rage. And what came about was that that woman had made me feel helpless the way something had happened long ago. And it was kind of stuck in there and stranded in the site, whatever it was, real or imagined. And I was able to identify it and see what it was. So for me, this is a never-ending journey. You know, it's progress, not perfection. I'm better than I ever was, and I thank God. And I have, I have a God in my life that without God, I am nothing. Without God, I am nothing. I could not go on an elevator because I'm claustrophobic without God. I could not go on a plane. I'm on planes all the time. I can do nothing without God. God is everything and I am nothing. And you know, there's many people today wanting to change our our fellowship. There's many things going on where they're trying to change all kind of things about our fellowship. I mean, what really needs to change since 1935? Can you think of anything? I can't. Bill and Bob, by some beautiful thing through God, gave us this, for hopeless alcoholics of my type, a hopeless drunk like me, to give my children back their mother, to give my brother back his sister, to give my family back a family member, and to let me have a little meaning and purpose in this world that for so long I destroyed, and I'm no longer pouring this thing into my life. So I want to thank Bill and Bob for what they gave us, for the sacrifice. I want to thank the lady who has 50 years for staying there and keeping the doors open. And I want to be here. Bill Wilson said the Alcoholics Anonymous is not a success story. Rather, it is the chronicle of our colossal human failure, turned to usefulness by the divine alchemy of a loving God. And thank you so much for having me here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.